Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at estore.asm.org. This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 200, recorded on September 18th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We have a really special episode today to celebrate the 200th time we've done this on TWIV. We're recording in Boston, Massachusetts at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, also known as The Needle. And joining me today, all the way on my right, from southeastern Massachusetts, <laughs> Southwestern, Northeastern, which was it again? Well, we're all in the same location. No, but you, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Alan Dove. Yes. Thank you, Alan. Western Massachusetts. Western Massachusetts. How could I forget that after 200 episodes? I don't know. Thanks for joining us, Alan. You must be getting old. <laughs> I am, that's for sure. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. How are you doing? I got that right. Yep, you got that right. So Rich and Alan uh, united for the first time. This is our Twitter. first time in the same room. And haven't seen each other. After hundreds of hours. Yes. yes. Literally. Yes, hundreds, of, hundreds hours. of hours of talking. This is actually our second day in this <clears throat> needle, this needle institute. And we have three <clears throat> guests that have been with us for that time. And starting on my left here, he's a professor of microbiology at Boston University. He's also the director of cell and tissue imaging in the Needle Institute, Paul Dupre. Nice to be here. You sure? Yep. Great to be here. You may remember Paul from Dublin. He jumped up on stage and said a few words, but uh, Paul is one of the reasons why we're here today. Also joining us to the left of Paul is uh, a, another professor of microbiology here at Boston University and also the associate director of the Biomolecule Production Corps in the Needle Institute. Elke Muehlberger. Yes. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and also for spending two days with us sure. as well. And all the way on my left, he's a professor and chair of microbiology here at Boston University. We're at the School of Medicine, by the way. And he's also the associate director of the Needle. Ron Corley. Good to be here. Thank you as well. So these three individuals have led us through this BSL-4 facility in the past few days. We've actually recorded what should be an amazing video, yes. so, right? Yeah. And it's only with their help that we've been able to do this, and a few other people behind the scenes as well. And so look for that in the, in the coming weeks. That's going to take longer to be posted than this episode. But when it does come up, we'll post a link, and it's going to be fabulous. We're really lucky because it's very rare for anyone to get inside of a BSL-4 except people who are working in it. Yep. And why could we do that here, Paul? Because unfortunately, uh, we are only able to bring in BSL-2 pathogens at the mm -hmm. moment. We've had a hiatus of opening. Right. So it's not a functioning BSL-4 yet, and that's why we can be in here. And in fact, uh, this is what one of the BSL-4 laboratories uh, would look like. We have the hanging air hoses for powering the suits uh, with air moving about. Uh, and uh, if you, when you look at the video, you get a closer look uh, at the BSL. And this is actually a room that's used for training. That's right. right. Yep. Yeah. And we, um, we earlier trained in here, yes. didn't we? So look for that. But today we're gonna chat about uh, the facility, uh, what it is and, and what it does. And maybe, Alka, you've worked in BSL-4s for almost 20 years. Yeah, that's true. So In Germany uh, starting, was yeah, that right? Yeah, exactly. So I was affiliated with the University of Marburg in Germany, and I did a lot of PSL-4 work, so mostly with Marburg and Ebola viruses right. and cell culture work. So I didn't do any work with animals. And you've been here how many years now? It's now four years. Okay, and, and before... Four frustrating years. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for the facility to open. Tell us a little bit about your background. You're a PhD, correct? Exactly. So I'm a PhD. Yeah. Where from? What do you mean with where University? From? Which university? The University of Marburg. So I okay. actually spent my entire scientific life with these viruses, so with Marburg and Ebola virus. Started kind of funny. So I started to work on the glycoprotein. That was my project during my diploma thesis. Mm -hmm. 
And so during this time, it was something to just sequence a gene. So I thought I would sequence the glycoprotein because of all these anti oxidation sites, but I couldn't find a stop codon. And I sequenced and sequenced mm. my uh -uh off and <laughs> <laughs> couldn't find this damn stop codon. Finally, after I wrote the thesis and described all the glycosylation and so on and so on, it turned out that it was the L gene, which is a huge gene. It's more than right. 6,000 amino uh, uh, nucleotides in length. But that was the reason why I got interested in replication and transcription of these viruses. And I did a lot of work on replication and transcription. Okay. And you also did a postdoc at Marburg as well? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. not a real postdoc. Actually, I didn't do a real postdoc. So I started to work as a PI after the PhD. Okay. So, so you were PI point. there for a yeah. time, then you moved here. Mm -hmm. How about you, Paul? I know you were in Belfast before you came here. Indeed. You were, and you still have a lab there. I still have a lab in Belfast, yeah. Where did you get your PhD? I got my PhD in Belfast, uh -huh. but working between Belfast and the Institute uh, for Animal Health okay. in Herbright. Okay. So I started life on the other side of RNA virology. Mm -hmm as a positive strand. The good side. The corn of her all. I just, oh, so. And then I realized that that was just too easy. So, <laughs> you know, these tiny little genomes, Elka's talked about the L. Yeah. It's bigger than your whole, uh, your whole oh, genome. Your virus. So it's bigger than polio virus. <laughs> so um, I decided to, uh, to, to move to po to, from positive stranded to negative mm -hmm. stranded viruses. And Perbright is another high containment facility. Yeah, Perbright's interesting because Perbright is the equivalent of uh, the British Plum Island facility. Right. So it's so for animal viruses. For its animal viruses. So I worked there on foot and mouth disease virus. And one of the things that has always interested me is reverse genetics. So I wanted what? to reverse learn. Reverse genetics? Yeah. So starting to make. That's why you switched to negative strand virus. <laughs> oh, my <okay. laughs> God. And then I'm now totally confused. I don't know what's. <laughs> I don't know what the front of a genome is and the back of a genome is. And once you've gone to from positive to negative, you can never go back because it takes you about okay. three years working that out. Um, Actually, yeah, so I, I went, went from to negative to positive. You went from yes. negative to positive. Why? Why? Because. <laughs> Because he wanted to work in something easy. <laughs> <laughs> so at Perbra, you worked in a BSL-4? BSL-4 is not uh, relevant for um, animal viruses. What we are doing mm. in Perbright is not protecting the operator from the virus because I can't get foot and mouth disease. What okay. we're doing is protecting the environment from the agent. So viruses like, uh, well, foot and mouth disease, blue tongue virus, African uh, swine fever, these types of viruses are present in Perbright. Again, similar to what you would have on Plum Island. So did you wear a suit at, at Perbright? No, no, what we no. wear in Perbright is not the suits, the full okay. suits that you have seen. We wear something akin to cricket whites. So cricket white. Yeah, you know, it's a sport. It's sort of like baseball, but longer. <laughs> Can go on for days. Can go on for days. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like literally, it's like cricket white. That's right. You know, I, I worked at Plum Island, the animal containment facility off of Long Island, and we used to wear whites as well. Cool. But um, we didn't call them cricket white. Well, the, that was the closest thing that I could think of what okay, uh, what they are. So the focus in a facility like that is on decontaminating you on the way out, so that you don't, exactly. so nothing gets out. absolutely. You're not going to catch anything. You're working. I mean, so you don't yeah. the whole. Yeah, and many ways the principles of Perbright, that's why even though I'm not a BSL person, like I don't have the experience that Elka has, so I'm in training at the moment. Um, but the principal concepts are exactly the same. You know, what you're doing, you're stopping the agent getting out. So we're taking, instead of a shower in a suit, we take uh, took a shower um, on the way out. Right. And, and again, foot and mouth is a good example. Very, very sensitive mm -hmm. to acids. So very weak solution of citric acid was enough to decontaminate, inactivate. So we use virus specific agents like mm -hmm. acid for foot and mouth. Right. So you came to the needle to to do what? To be part of the BSL four? Was that an attraction for you? So <clears throat> unlike Elko, we my lab doesn't work on BSL four agents. What's right. very attractive for me in needle is this connection of cores. So whenever you introduce Elka and myself, you introduce us as the director of particular core right. units. Right biomolecular production, um, and I'm 
uh, cell and tissue, look after cell and tissue imaging. So what we've done with our BSL-2 agents is we've done a lot of imaging, live cell imaging of paramyxoviruses, measles and mumps mm -hmm. uh, virus, for example, a, a lot of work on an animal virus, closely related one, canine distemper virus. And we've been able to take the viruses, manipulate the viruses, they express green fluorescent proteins, so we can actually see them in vitro, in right. disease relevant cells that they naturally right. infect, but we can also see them then in vivo. Uh, so we can really do macroscopic imaging of the disease as it progresses. And you ask why I come to Needle? Well, this is the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories. And this, as you've seen, whenever you've been walking around, is a perfect place if you're interested in pathogenesis. So if you like reverse genetics, so uh, making viruses from uh, DNA or clones, mm -hmm. if you like that, um, one of the things which always was difficult for people who liked reverse genetics is they, it was so difficult to do, so hard to do, that the molecular virology people spent a lot of time making viruses and then didn't really use them. So they got a little bit frustrated. So I. Uh, um, I always said that whenever I had a lab, what I wanted us to do is make the viruses, but also be in a position that we can use the viruses to ask questions. And disease has always interested me. And the flip side of that is um, vaccines and attenuation has all, all also interested me. So I like understanding pathogenesis on one side of the coin uh, and uh, disease, uh, sorry, uh, vaccines on the other. You need to understand sure. Right. both sides One of that coin to actually even begin to rationally and logically develop new vaccines, I think. So you, uh, your work on measles will continue in your regular lab here at, at yeah. BU? So I'm very fortunate. I have, we, we're all in microbiology. Right. So I have my lab over in microbiology. Yeah. And if we want to <clears> do work on vaccines, understanding the really good vaccines. How does it work? What is, what's the molecular basis that makes measles vaccine such a great vaccine? Uh, we can do that, of course, in, um, in the BSL-2 facility right. over right. in microbiology. Uh, so we have a program of work where we're really trying to understand, well, what's the best way to deliver that vaccine? What's the best uh, route of delivery? Do If we deliver this virus, which is you know, not normally, you don't get measles by getting jabbed in the arm with a needle. That's not how, how you typically get measles. So if we deliver it by a, a different route, aerosol delivery, will it give us better protection? Mm -hmm. so, and those are really important questions, I think, to understand as we mm -hmm. move forward and try to develop new vaccines for these emerging uh, infectious agents. So I, I like that, that uh, leveraging the knowledge from BSL-2 into BSL-3, and then ultimately, I think, as someone who's also very interested in Zoonosis. So you will do BSL-4 work using your expertise, which is in cell imaging, live cell imaging, and so forth, uh, here in the BSL-4 on the pathogens that are worked on. So what kind of viruses would he be imaging here? In the so I have the whole panel of BSL-4 viruses, so this is Marburg and Ebola viruses I already okay. mentioned, and we have people working on Nipah and Hendra virus, mm -hmm. like Catherine Bossack, for example, who's also a BSL-4 researcher. Then uh, one virus I think that you are especially interested in is Korean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. Okay. So most of these viruses are RNA viruses. Most of these viruses are negative strand RNA viruses, which makes them <laughs> extremely interesting. We have like, some exceptions, maybe viruses. Which <clears throat> nobody really works on these guys because for obvious reasons. And <clears throat> Yeah, and then there is one uh, BSL-4 agent, we already talked about that, which is, is a real exception, and that's a DNA virus, smallpox, but nobody's allowed to work on this virus. Right. So well, we already know that the RNA virus is RAIN, <laughs> yeah. as far as disease agents go. We don't have to discuss that. So before we get too far into the trash talk, uh, Ron, yes. what brought you here? Distracting me from the trash talk. <laughs> well, I was here before these two were here. Um, uh, I was recruited here as the chair of microbiology, and I, you know, what really attracted me to come to Boston University in the first place was the collegiality, the fact that there was a long-term plan in place for really uh, building a premier research uh, organization uh, within the university, uh, and the resources to begin to do it. And so, so you you were here before this facility, before this and... facility, right? So I was brought here to to basically revamp and rebuild uh, a department of microbiology. 
Okay. So, when was that? Uh, it was 94. Okay. So you have a southern accent. I do. Where is you? Were you from the south originally? I am from the south. And I'm you, a transplanted southerner. Most people go the other direction, but uh, <laughs> I chose to come here because it's just too damn hot. <laughs> <laughs> and your PhD is from where? Uh, Duke. In, in what field? In microbiology and immunology. Okay. Did you also so, postdoc at Duke as well? No, I went to uh, Basel Institute for Immunology okay. and uh, worked there for a few years and then came back to Duke on the faculty and was there when I moved here. Okay. Actually, it's really funny because he has a Swiss accent when he's speaking German. Really? <laughs> it's really funny. So you speak it? German? Uh, no, Schweiz and Deutsch. So you speak German with a Swiss accent. Well, the only, accent. Way, the only words I know that uh, are Swiss or not is I have to go into Germany and listen to people laugh at this American speaking Swiss and German. So, <laughs> nice. Nice. so uh, when you came, the, the needle was not yet being planned, is that correct? Oh, it uh, was years away from being mm -hmm. even thought about. Yeah. So that... So why, why, let's explore the roots of this institute. Fred, why, why build this type of facility and also why build it in downtown Boston? Yeah, so the basic, so the, the, the roots of this facility as well as many other components of the uh, NIAID um, um, Emerging Infectious Disease Network uh, really came out of 9-11. Right. Um, and, and the, the anthrax, anthrax attacks. and the anthrax attacks, and the issues then were to ask the question: Are we really prepared for a bioterrorist episode? Uh, and so, like many things at the National Institutes of Health, they actually ask a panel of scientists. They set up a, a blue ribbon panel to actually come back and make recommendations to the NIH on how they should uh, uh, respond. And uh, what they came, what this panel looked at was not just the issue of, of bioweapons, but they really looked at the issue of emerging pathogens worldwide. And I think it's quite frightening when you really look at the map. If you've, any of you have looked at Tony Fauci's uh, map of emerging viruses all over the world, you know that they are emerging at an unbelievable rate. About three-fourths of them are zoonotic the, that have arisen over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the problem is, is that even though they may arise in one part of the world, you're basically 36 hours away from any place else in the world. Right. And there are well-known examples of diseases being picked up on a plane and taken elsewhere, either by mosquito or by a human, uh, and established endemic diseases. West Nile is a good example of that right. uh, in this country. So uh, they really uh, decided that we neither had the capacity uh, to uh, study uh, pathogens in containment. We didn't have enough capacity, certainly not in an academic setting, and we did not have a trained workforce. And so the National Institutes of Health wanted to establish a couple of facilities like this in academic centers where you train the next generation of scientists, but also where you get people who have never really thought about infectious diseases and give them the opportunity to bring their expertise to bear. So was this then a project that um, this particular lab, obviously there are others as well, and mm -hmm. we may touch on those at some point, but uh, there are other facilities being built and planned. Um, was this a, uh, they took um, uh, proposals and this one won out? Yeah, it was a competitive uh, process. There were, I believe, nine institutions that put in full proposals. So NIH puts out a request for proposals. Request right. For proposals, right. right. And then uh, there is a response from the academic mm -hmm. community. And you wrote one of these. Uh, well, Mark Klempner and, and, and Jack Murphy actually wrote the original proposal. Some of us, like myself, put in components of it. Mm -hmm. I put in the immunology core component because I'm an immunologist by training. Uh, but they really were the two individuals that were responsible for really getting this assembled. That and a whole team of architects and, and planners to plan out a facility like this. So the, was the proposal just specifically <clears throat> For this facility or for a larger program surrounding the facility? That was for this facility. Okay. Um, and at the same time, they had put out uh, RFAs for the regional centers of excellence right. that are set That's up in all the different about. public health. So there were different proposals for okay. different types of... And um, these are big grants. I mean, the film, we see how huge this facility right. is. This is not a million dollars or so. This is... No, a, a million will barely cover the operating costs of this facility once it's over. Right. Yeah. So what was the total? Um, 
So the total project cost, I think, by the time we finished was somewhere uh, just under $200 million uh, for a facility that's about 170,000 square feet of space. Um, so you, and, and, it's, and it was it was mat, it was money that came from both the federal government as well as from the university. Right. So it was a three to one match. And so now it's built. Right. It's built. It's ready. Yes, it is. And we've got this two hundred million dollar facility built mm -hmm. and ready, and it's sitting here. Yes, Why, you've, noticed, you've noticed that. Well, you? Yes, I know that. there don't <laughs> seem to be a lot of people around. It's Why? Inside. Yeah. What's <laughs> What's going on? So, well, you know, the, the original, the, the early types of risk assessments that have been done, there are very few risk assessments that have ever been done on containers. What, so what, what do you mean by a risk assessment? A risk assessment is uh, what is the likelihood that something could happen in the facility that would affect the individuals within the facility or individuals in the community outside? Uh, so you need to file one of these before you're approved to open up a facility? You had to file one even before you started okay. uh, as part of the process. And the choice at that time was to use essentially a, a release of, of anthrax spores. And the reason for using a release of anthrax spores is because anthrax is stable in the environment, the spores are. It can spread for long distances on the wind, and it can continue to affect a population for long periods of time. And so we have a historical, historical right. example of such an incident. And we have a very different facility. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So this is a, you're using that as a model assessment for the risk assessment? Of, of really what a worst case scenario would right. be. Right. And there were um, some concerns that were raised by a group of individuals that filed a suit in federal and in state court. And their concerns was, that's not really a worst case scenario, although nobody really knows what a worst case scenario is. These individuals are from, from the community? There are a few in the community, and there are a couple of, of law firms that are involved in, in these okay. suits. And there, what they said was there were a couple of things missing. So one was anthrax doesn't spread from person to person. Therefore, it doesn't really model many of the infectious right. diseases. Um, and the second issue was that um, we didn't really do a comparison between three potential sites. At the time, the university owned sites in the rural part of New Hampshire and a, in a uh, you know, slightly less than a town, city, and then in the city. So suburban setting, a rural setting, and urban. What they wanted was a comparison was why would you put a facility like this why in the middle downtown. of a downtown, right. a downtown area. So this is happening before you even identify the site. No, this was happening actually as the building was being oh, built. Right. Oh, okay. So you right. had, um, in letting the public know about this facility, I mean, did you did you involve community groups early on as the planning was occurring? There were there were large numbers of, of meetings with the community, and I think one of the things that we've learned from this is that you can't do too many different community meetings. You can't find too many ways to communicate with the community. I've kind of developed a, a, a rule of seven that I need to tell an audience seven times in at least three different ways before they actually hear anything that I say. <laughs> it's probably just me, but you know, the, the reality is, is that no matter how many meetings that you have, there's still segments of the population that I think we failed to have a conversation about these facilities, how they're built, why they're safe, uh, what the experience has been, and Face it, I mean, you look at the building and you'll show pictures of the building. The building is built in the middle of a big setback with a huge fence around it, doing uh, infectious disease research with some scary pathogens. That, and people know pathogens often from, you know, looking at scary films. And so they think of these things like, uh, like a nuclear blast or a chemical spill where things get up in the atmosphere and get released into communities. And so... I think we failed at educating uh, and having honest conversations with the community uh, about this. Uh, but eventually what happened was is that they required a new risk assessment, and this risk assessment took a process of about two and a half years. Uh, and it's recently been completed, and it, uh, the NIH is um, scheduled to put out a record of decision within the next um, one to three weeks, I think. And um, that will start the process rolling, assuming that the record of decision is this is a safe facility to build. But that's what the risk assessment now, said. Now, did you also have to, besides a risk assessment, did you have to assess the impact of this facility on 
the surrounding, I mean, environmental impact assessment is pretty standard for most right. buildings. Right, right. So the environmental impact statement, uh, environmental impact in terms of the building itself. Right. I mean, this whole uh, area where you see a number of new buildings that have been built here has all been uh, done in the past. Right. So that kind of siting of a building here, a research facility, is already... And, and there's not, there, it's not considered to be anything special that, um, I mean, the effect... I'm thinking the effect a facility like this might have on property values, for example, as opposed to an office building. Uh, I, I think, you know, because we're sitting in the middle of a medical campus already, I mean, that the campus is already here, uh, that will have very little impact. As a matter of fact, since this building has gone up, there's a set of luxury condos that were built okay. right across the street. I think, you know, the pressures on housing here are significant enough that uh, I don't think property value. And it feels very much like a medical campus. This it is does. a substantial facility. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all the hospital and et cetera, everything around. Yeah. So you... When was construction mm -hmm. completed on the facility? Uh, about three and a half, four years ago, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of things that had to be dealt with uh, uh, in the meantime. Uh, but basically, over the last two and a half years, we've been so waiting if, for the risk assessment to get if, done. If uh, the NIH uh, decision is favorable, mm -hmm. when could you open as a BSL-4? So there's still a number of, of uh, steps that have to uh, be taken. Okay. So first of all, there's the filing for both the state and the federal courts um, mm -hmm. and litigating those cases. Um, but then there's a normal process when you're ready to open a building facility that you have to go through. So we're doing uh, BSL-2 work in the facility now. In the BSL-4 labs. And in the BSL-2 labs. We we'll already have people labs. moved into BSL-2 labs here as well. Because it's the perfect right. time, mm -hmm. we take advantage of the opportunity to practice and work out the standard operating right. procedures and yeah. use the viruses that we've talked about to, to, to basically mirror what we would do because you just don't open the doors and bring in the BSL-4 agents right. and get going. So we're practicing. Mm -hmm. so you're using BSL-2 agents, but you do the whole suiting up and everything. That's right. Absolutely. And that way, if something does get screwed up at that stage, mm -hmm. because you're learning, you learn, oh, well, we need to remember to do this. Exactly. Right. Well, the reality is uh, it, it's it's no different to doing it in your normal BSL-2 hood. Right. So in terms of the work, we have all of the permissions to do the BSL-2 work. It's no different to what uh, we do across in mm -hmm. the lab in microbiology other than you're wearing the suit. Right. And that's giving you the feeling of the suit. We get to talk about the best way to decontaminate, the best way to move around. People get spatially aware of uh, where the airlines are, right. how to move around, how many people are too many people in a particular space. So that's the big advantage. If there's any advantage to the protracted uh, um, period, we've been able to prepare quite, mm -hmm. quite well for for, for right. the right. day, whenever we are, yeah, that'll give us. That'll, I think that'll give us a real advantage because we still have to go through. I mean, we still have to go through uh, the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Agency to, to get permission to open it as a level three and four. So that's a separate permission. Uh, we need to go to the MWRA to give them uh, to allow us a permit for ESL three and four discharge, uh, and. Um, you know, then the Boston Public Health Commission this is the only city in the United States that I'm aware of where their public health commission actually regulates containment laboratories. That's BSL-3 as well as the BSL-4. Okay. Boston, so, has, a, Boston has a long history yes. of being interested in biological research. Yes. Going back to recombinant DNA, which we've, of course, we've, we've talked about. Before. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually have to get going. Unfortunately. Well, you're not allowed out of here. I'm not allowed out of here. So I have, you have to go to through the chemical shower, right? <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, right. Have you got an umbrella? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we're, it's, we're sorry we started late, and that's yeah. why I have to leave. But thanks for joining us. And yes. We'll see you on the video, right? Absolutely. All right. And very, very interesting. Thank you. Well, it's oh, been but delightful yes. to meet you. That is nice yeah. to meet you. Finally, after hearing you so often, uh, it's you been got great a pick to here. Yes, I do have a pick of the week, so I'll do this very quickly. Um, I actually was surprised to, to uh, learn, I don't think we've picked this before. Um, this is a contest that's been going on for a few years now. It's called Dance Your PhD. Yeah. Um, and I believe Science Magazine sponsors this. It... Um, it turns out the deadline for the 2012 is uh, the 1st of October, 
So you have a couple of weeks to dance and come up with choreography that represents your doctoral thesis. Um, and it's probably a little late for any of us to do this, but do you remember? Um, your doctoral yes, thesis. exactly. <laughs> yeah, look it up. But but for those of you who are now now defending or getting ready to defend, here's a good way to procrastinate. Uh, <laughs> so you can you can come up with some sort of interpretive dance that represents your results. And if you go to the the link that we have in the show notes, you can see the information for this year, and that'll subsequently link to some of the entries from previous years, uh, which are are. Very, very interesting to watch, and I think quite fun. Cool. Thanks, that's great. And since right. he's going outside, he can tell us what the temperature is because you yeah, haven't so done we'll that. Go and find out what's going on outside. It's cloudy and rainy and a little bit windy. <laughs> yeah, we can see outside, which is not typically the case in a BSL 4, but since this is a simulation room, there's an right. observation room right next to us, and we can see outside. Good, so have a good trip back, Alan. All right. And we'll Thank see you. you next time. Yes. All right. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, Alan. Take care. Hey, Alan. Elka, you, okay. you came here from Marburg, yes. which is a wonderful city, yeah. to start to work in this BSL-4. How many years now have you been waiting for it to open? Yeah, so four years, so. So when you first arrived, Elka, what was the anticipated opening of the four. Did you think in a year or two it would be open and you could work yes. immediately? Yeah, so yeah. the anticipated date was the end of 2008 and then we got all this trouble with the risk assessment, so the risk assessment had to be redone, as one mm -hmm. already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You seem like a pretty happy person despite uh, the <laughs> setback. Yes. That's her colleagues. <laughs> uh, of course not. So the reason why I'm so happy is that we are still able to do BSL-4 work. So the people in my lab are going back and forth to other BSL-4 facilities here in the U.S. Right. So I really would like to thank all these guys who are so supportive to us. So the BSL-4 community here in the U.S. is really, really great. So we get a lot of support from these colleagues. So I'm sure you, Ron, and all three of you are very positive about the prospect of this uh, facility opening, but there's probably a, a remote possibility that it won't open as a four. Have you thought about that and what would happen if that were the case, or do you think this is absolutely impossible? Well, I don't think there's any opportunity to say that nothing is yeah. possible or impossible at this particular point. Typical scientist. Typical, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, all the time. Yeah, yes, they can't say anything absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Today's dogma is tomorrow's lie, you know, exactly. the usual. Um, you know, I think the risk assessment, the fact that, that we now have what I think everyone would agree is a scientifically credible risk assessment. Mm -hmm. It's the first one ever done. Uh, on level threes and fours in the United States, to my knowledge, certainly not to this level, uh, that really has gone through a lot of pathogens, a lot of different scenarios at, at three, at four, has compared different types of community settings yeah. for these laboratories and has shown that these labs uh, have a very, very remote possibility of anyone getting infected, much less getting out and uh, impacting the community. And I think with that, and the fact that it's had two independent scientifically scientific teams review it and have endorsed it as credible, mm -hmm. um, I would think it would be very difficult for the courts to rule that this wasn't a credible risk assessment. But you don't know. Sure. And of course, there is still a small contingent of opposition that uh, really just don't want the facility here, and I feel pretty certain will do what they can to try to stop it from opening. Yeah. But we're feeling as cautiously optimistic as we ever have since the uh, report has been released uh, that we will get permission to go forward. And if we uh, are given that permission, then, um, you know, we'll, we'll progress accordingly. I think it's because you see the potential. You know, as you've walked around, mm -hmm. you've seen the facility, you've seen the potential. For many times in the past, you've talked about what these agents do the diseases mm -hmm. they cause. So in other 12 episodes, and you see what such a facility can contribute to that scientific endeavor. So that's why I think it's really worth being positive yeah. about, mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. So I mean, this, Elka, I'm sorry, but you've had a, a, a long history of high containment work like this. Yes. How does this facility compare to your experience? Well, I mean, that's like heaven. 
for VSO4 research. <laughs> Actually, I already dreamed of this facility. So literally, during the night, and I did wonderful experiments, and then I was really disappointed when I woke up in the morning. And, oh, no, it's not real. <laughs> did you write down so the ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah, be writing down the ideas. Yes. <laughs> it's like a huge treasure in front of you, and you're not allowed to touch it. So that's really my feeling about it, because this facility provides the opportunity <clears throat> to perform experiments, which is just not possible with smaller BSL4 labs. So we have the expertise of colleagues like Paul with imaging and others with the MRI and whatever. So there is a lot of knowledge and expertise in this building. Is this like the largest BSL4 facility around? Yeah, I think there will be another one at your similar, right? That's yeah, the OSAMRIT facility. Is yeah, going to be but right now there is another one which is very, very similar in um, in Galveston. Okay. So it's kind of the twin lab. Okay. It's the biggest one in South Boston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, but, so these facilities, the size say, yeah. of these facilities, uh, this is this is really really unusual for years. So for usually have like two rooms, maybe one hundred square meters. How much square feet is that? Uh -huh. uh, 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 well, so not too iPhone. not too big, and then you have a small room for uh, animal work, or you have even have to do the work, the cell culture work, and the animal work in the same room, and that's it. So this is really something very very special. It's really worth to wait for it. So I'm curious, uh, Ron. You said that uh, so you applied for a grant, you got the grant to build this building. Mm -hmm. Here we are. It's not going to be cheap to run going forward, where does that money come from? Well, right now um, we're under a supplemental grant from NIAID okay. to help us um, keep the facility open. We've certainly done everything that we can to reduce expenses uh, in the facility and just restrict the, the use to the, the areas that are under use. Um, and once we are given permission, once we get to the point where we're given permission to open at level four um, and are permitted to do so, then the so-called year six grant uh, we hope will begin. And that will be a grant that will support the differential costs of doing level four research and only level four research. Otherwise, all the other research that's in this building, all the subsidies that have to go into level three, uh, as well as the subsidies that have to go into supporting level two research will be supported as they are in any other academic institution. Okay, so there'll be individual grants or and program grants. Science has to be done to, through individual grants. Uh, and, but then but then supplemental money from the NIH uh, that recognizes that this is a BSL-4 facility that's costly to run. Yeah, and to have, you know, as you noticed when you came in, we have a security group that is a you know, trained differently. They're part of the, the Boston University Police, but they are trained separately and they're dedicated to this building. We have to have facilities people that are dedicated to this building. We have to have environmental health and safety people that are dedicated and trained in this building. So the personnel infrastructure, much less the electrical costs to maintain a facility like this are actually quite high. Uh, and they recognize that it's very difficult to recover that on research grants. So and think so, of that space above yeah. the BSL-2 facility you were in yesterday. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work involved making mm -hmm. sure that that's safe yeah, for Alka and I one floor down right. at that hood. Yeah. yeah, in the video, which we'll, we'll see, we went through some of yeah. these space, not that particular space, but we went over, we went over the space of the BSL-4, and you mm -hmm. can see the equipment, the heap of filtration, and how maintenance yeah. is so important. It's amazing. It's mind-boggling. Um, let's. I want to take a really negative view. Let's mm -hmm. say the NIH says no, we don't like this risk assessment again. What do you do? Try again? Uh, you keep trying and trying, or is there a point where you don't try anymore? There's no reason to think like that. I, I just want to know what would. <laughs> I'm not saying it will happen, but uh, you know, there's always a remote possibility. What well, the well, the risk assessment to be clear was the NIH's risk assessment on this facility. Yeah. It okay. wasn't a risk assessment run by Boston University, right? Okay. So it was their risk assessment. So I think the decisions, to a large extent, would be uh, a partner decision between the NIH mm -hmm. and uh, the university. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've that we've had the opportunity to see, and I think it's a sad opportunity, but one of the things that we've witnessed over this last few months mm -hmm. is uh, outbreaks of disease in the United States. And I think one of the concerns that people have always raised is, 
all these level four agents are exotic agents. They don't exist in the U.S. Um, true ex to a point, except that you can certainly fly them in, and there are examples of that. Uh, but the other thing is, is that the, uh, the hantavirus outbreak um, is, hantavirus is generally studied, depending on what you're doing, at level two or three, but actually the recommendations for, if you're gonna really do pathogenesis, you have to concentrate the virus, you have to do animal work, and those are recommended to be undertaken at level four. So that's an example of an agent in, in the U.S. that I think uh, a facility like this mm -hmm. would help uh, you study. And remember, it's not just a question of turning on a switch and everyone can do the work. Yeah. You know, it's not, oh, there's something here, what are we going to do? So maintaining a well-trained cohort of virologists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that, uh, in, in, in this type of an environment with a large amount of experience, that's pretty important. It was like yeah. whenever SARS came yeah, along, sure. yeah. luckily mm -hmm. somebody knew what a coronavirus <laughs> was, you know, because you could have easily said to the coronavirus people, oh, what, why are you working on those viruses? I mean, a few coughs and a few sneezes, you know, that's not really a virus. But you knew, people knew how to grow them. People knew how to do plaque assays. People had antibodies. People had clones. So okay. that's the type of the argument I think so as maybe well. Maybe I chime in because SARS coronavirus is a very, very good example why we need these BSL four laboratories because SARS coronavirus is uh, a BSL three agent, and actually it is not a BSL three agent because it fits all criteria for BSL four. So once it was discovered, there was neither treatment nor vaccine, and mm. it was highly lethal in humans. So it's a classical BSL four agent, but there are not enough BSL-4 labs and BSL, uh, BSL-4 researchers available to study this virus, and it had to be done really, really quickly because we needed something to do against this virus. So, and I think, yeah, today with these additional BSL-4 labs would be much easier to work on these viruses, and there were uh, lab infections with that coronavirus in China. So, I mean, it's the best example how important these high containment mm -hmm. labs are if there is something pops up which never... Uh, correct before yeah, and yeah. it's highly lethal and you have to do something. I think your point is very good that you should be prepared, if anything, mm -hmm. to work on agents which may come up in the next years, right? Mm -hmm. And so this gives you the training. But also, Ron, you said there are no uh, BSL-4 pathogens in the U.S., but why can't we help the rest of the world, right? I mean, absolutely. Isn't, isn't altruism appreciated no, any I, longer? No, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> You know, the ecology of disease is now a global ecology. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, you know the, the point I was trying to make is, is that people look at it as, you know, with that kind of protected view of, well, it's not our disease, therefore we shouldn't be worried about it. But and I think that the reality is, is that with, uh, with climate change, and climate change, whether it's man-made or not, is irrelevant. We are undergoing some climate change. Diseases are moving into areas that they were not found before. Uh, CCHV is a good example of a disease that through ticks is beginning to spread mm -hmm. into areas that it wasn't found before into Europe, uh, Central Europe, and I think that it's just a matter of time. Multidrug resistant uh, uh, TB. Once you get into uh, extreme drug resistant and total drug resistant, where do you actually study the pathogenesis of that agent? And while bringing it into a level four lab would would be very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. The reality is the danger is always to the person doing the study. And you have to be able to protect that individual and the best protection is in fact a level four laboratory. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious about how this facility will be staffed. Mm -hmm. um, or do you imagine that all of the <clears throat> principal investigators in the facility will be people who have uh, academic or professional appointments that are local, or will there be a significant amount of collaborative activity? How's that going to work? Yeah, so that, you know, it's it's a very good question. It's uh, very difficult to imagine that you're going to fill this entire facility after you've seen the size of it. And, you know, level three space is the same size as the level four. It's, it's a vast amount of space. It's hard to believe that we will fill all of the space with our own investigators. One of, the, one of the things that we feel is that this building won't be a success unless we have national and international collaborations that are part of it. And so we've already begun to reach out to other biosafety level four labs in countries where diseases emerge. 
uh, to begin to see how we can partner together and do things collaboratively that neither of us can do alone. And I think that's going to be a big measure of our success. Is so I'll, you'll have an opportunity to return the favor. Well, that's what I was just going to chime in with. Whenever you think of why can't we help the um, uh, people outside of America, and that is reciprocated whenever you look at this is where the agents are, this is where the diseases are circulating, and they then um, reciprocate that and help us by forming these partnerships. So, for example, uh, Ron has just been in South Africa forming a partnership with people who are able to work with uh, bat viruses, right? Mm -hmm. If they are able to have mm -hmm. the endemic bats, we're not easily going to, even with all of the space that we have here, um, are we going to be easily able to set up a huge bat breeding facility? You know, that's not going to be possible. So, whenever you're reaching out and doing uh, useful things for other parts of the world, then that becomes a reciprocal and it's a win-win. It's a win-win situation. So, in fact, this facility was set up, you know, we've talked about, you know, the science course, the immunology, the biomolecule production, yeah. cellular tissue imaging, but we also have a collaborative core. Yeah. And that collaborative core is specifically designed to help make it possible for people to do research here, mm -hmm. uh, as well as to partner with other institutions like we're currently so we, we have um, this collaborative core, even though it's, I'm not part of the collaborative core. I was at a meeting in New Delhi, and one of the people, one of the, the groups for, came from the National Institute of Virology mm -hmm. in Pune, mm -hmm. down yep. in, uh, yeah, in, in southern uh, India. And the collaborative core, because I was there, were able to facilitate me visiting the, our colleagues in Pune, again, just mm -hmm. to keep up that connection so I can go. I can give a seminar, I can talk with their scientists, their scientists can mail me. And that's where, just like the viruses don't know any borders, you know, viruses are not just going to say, oh, uh, there's America, I'm going to stay in Canada, right? <laughs> that's the way we have to think. We have to yeah. think internationally with these viruses because at the end of the day, if we just bring the viruses in here, they're all out there to begin with. Sure. So it, it's interesting that um, you, you mentioned before some of the agents that will be worked on, mm -hmm. ELCA, they're all negative stranded RNA viruses with envelopes. Yeah. So we had this conversation yesterday. Tell us why that's the case and you can't easily work with some other agent here. So the advantage of having these viruses as BSL4 agents is that they are sensitive to the same inactivating agents. So usually use detergents because they have this envelope and right. it's easy to, to kill them. And it's much more complicated with other viruses such as polio virus, right. which doesn't have this nice envelope. So it's, it's uh, much more difficult to mm -hmm. kill this virus. So and therefore you're kind of happy or not happy. But, I mean, it's, it is as it is, but it's convenient to have kind of very similar group of viruses right. which are working on. So you have a couple of standard procedures for yes. decontamination. Yes. One is the chemical decontamination, yes. and that's a detergent and a quaternary ammonium salt, mm -hmm. right? Microchem. Yeah. Microchem. Yeah. Plus. And the other, if you yeah. want to decontaminate a space, is vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Right. And what you're saying is that that will take care of all the agents that you're going to work on in this facility. In the level four, yes. yes. In the level four, in right. Level okay. four, there are other agents out there that are select agents that would not necessarily be susceptible to those. Absolutely. And you're not going to bring those in. Because yeah. it just messes up all the SOP. Yeah. yeah, there are different select agents that are, you know, some of the level three agents are also select agents. Yeah. You know, they have, you have your own SOPs for each doing them. So if you, you know, if you can imagine we have... A chemical shower, we have one type of, of substance that we use in that chemical shower. Mm -hmm. If for any reason we ever decided we were going to bring another level four agent in or, or study something at level four that was not sensitive to that, we'd have to actually separate out a whole new set of chemical yeah. showers, a whole new set of laboratories, oh. and put them aside. In a facility mm -hmm. like this, that's much more doable than it would be in a smaller facility where we could partition off some space. So but it would be extraordinary, it would be difficult and it would be expensive to make the transition, but I think if there were the, the need, it could be done. I had not appreciated that at all. No, right? me neither. Right? Level, level, level 4 is level 4. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So this is really eye-opener. So one example would be in when polio is eradicated, it becomes a BSL-4 <coughs> Do you think that will ever happen? 
Uh, oh. <laughs> you should you should say I'm the one asking the question. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to kind of fill by a lot of other times so that you can think. No, 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 no. Tell us. Tell us something. Maybe the high priority. Yeah. I think. I think it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. It will take time. It's not going to happen. Think a little bit negatively. Okay. <laughs> what happens? Uh, if it's never eradicated. Well, we, have plenty, we, have, we have plenty. If it's never eradicated, then I can keep working. Huh? <laughs> but that's selfish. It's not. It's not about what I have to do. Uh, I think it will be eradicated. Okay. It will take some time because it's not just a matter of having a good vaccine. There are political issues and wars yeah. and so yes. forth that keep it. Absolutely. But th it's been shown in India is the most amazing example. They had hundreds and hundreds of cases not too long ago, and now it's less than 100 cases. This is amazing. So, you know, the next yeah. step is Pakistan and so forth. But um, I think eventually it will be, and it will become a BSL-4 and then if you wanted to work on it, you couldn't just bring it in here. I had never appreciated right. that. Yeah, no, so it would be really difficult. I mean, of course, you could ask you guys how to inactivate the thing. Yes, but yeah, it's complicated. But we'd have to write new SOPs that change yeah. processes, yeah. change some of the engineering. Right. Yeah. But perhaps yeah. elsewhere there's a BSL-4 yeah. that could deal with mm -hmm. polio because mm -hmm. it works on non-envelope viruses and already has the protocols in place to do that. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. Just one of the many layers of complexity that we yeah. don't appreciate and which we've gained some insight into by, by visiting here. Yeah. And then, actually, I would like to mention something because I think it's really important to mention that most of these viruses are not transmitted by aerosol because that's mm -hmm. something most, or not most, but a lot of people think because of all these movies and these scary books that fetal viruses are like flu. So, yeah. so you enter yeah. a room, there is fetal virus or Ebola virus in this room, and then you present your death, like in five minutes, you are gonna. And that's not really true, or it's not, it's absolutely not true, because fetal viruses are transmitted by body fluids, mm -hmm. and so some of the other viruses are really transmitted by aerosols, but not easily. So that's another layer of biosafety, okay. in a way, that so most of these viruses are not easily transmitted between humans, or not easily by aerosols. So if they were? I will, it's really something I would mm -hmm. like to know people. <laughs> If they were, yeah, would the protocols in, in the facility be any different if they were aerosol transmitted? No. No. So not in a BSL-4. Okay. Because BSL-4 is BSL-4 is BSL-4. Yeah. So yeah. if you think BSL about BSL transmissibility, now yeah. smallpox yeah. is controlled in these two locations and no one's working yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, measles is a brilliant yeah. example. Every yeah. time I come back into Boston, mm -hmm. I see signs in the Boston Logan Airport, have you been in an area where measles is yeah. endemic? Yeah. Because the infectivity of that virus, the transmissibility of that virus, highly, highly transmissible. One of the other aspects of this facility I wanted to mention, I think it's important for everyone to know that this is not just a BSL-4 facility, it's a BSL-2 and a BSL-3. Now, why is that out there? Why have all in one building? So because, so when we start with BSL-4, we need a lot of support from BSL-2. For example, you would split your cells in BSL-2 before you infect the cells in BSL-4. So the other way around, you inactivate your material in BSL-4, like RNA or samples for rest blood analysis, whatever you would like to investigate, or your samples, yep. if it is not lifestyle imaging. And then you bring them out, and then you investigate the samples at BSL-2. So you, BSL-2 support is really needed for both, for BSL-3 and BSL-4. And then BSL-3, I mean, there are a lot of very important pathogens that are BSL-3. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's it's uh, absolutely essential to work on, on those pathogens as well. And it's just, I think, kind of logical to combine these expertise so that we have the whole set of viruses and not only viruses, mm -hmm. also some bacteria, of course, in the same building. So we've talked a lot about BSL-4 without really defining what it is. And we've seen a lot on our tour about the structure, but could you summarize in terms of the building structure and the air and water handling and the, how you work in the facility, what distinguishes a BSL-4 facility from something like BSL-3 or BSL-2? Sure, there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of differences. Um, it starts with the fact that in BSL-4, it actually has to be a, a separable building. So this building, the BSL-4 facility, is actually a separate building that was built inside of this facility. 
the second thing is, is that the engineering that goes into it is quite different. For example, BSL-3, you exhaust the air out of BSL-3 through a single HEPA filter. For BSL-4, it's two HEPA filters. In BSL-3, you don't have to filter the air coming in. BSL-4, you do. Uh, and it's just, these are all kind of what they call N plus one precautions to make sure that uh, whatever you need, you have a redundant uh, system uh, to ensure safety. Uh, there are the chemical showers. You don't find those in level three. Uh, nothing comes out of a level four except your glasses. Um, you must uh, strip and take everything off before you actually leave the facility. That gets autoclaved. Uh, so your scrubs get autoclaved. That's not necessarily uh, the case in a, in a level three lab. Uh, and you take a body shower. Yeah, the negative um, pressure sequence. And, you know, so there, there's a whole sequence of events as, as you've gone through it that you see is that uh, you just layer upon layer upon layer in order to get into the facility. Each of the individual rooms are isolated rooms uh, that allow you to decontaminate them independently from each other. Um, so... So filtered air going in and going out, mm -hmm. uh, any solid waste is decontaminated by autoclave. Autoclave out. Nothing goes mm -hmm. out. All of the liquid waste goes, uh, gets decontaminated, all right? Well, it, you start doing it exactly as you would in a level three lab. You would decontaminate it by the sink, but then in a level four, because this is N plus one, you dump it down the sink. The sink goes into dedicated tanks on the first floor. And these are what we call euphemistically cook tanks. And these are essentially sterilizers where once these tanks are full, all the liquid waste that has already been inactivated gets reinactivated again, okay. basically by autoclave. Uh, and then on top of all that, you're wearing <clears throat> spacesuits and yeah. uh, drink uh, and, uh, and breathing filtered How did you like it? Uh, it was weird. Actually, it was really cool. It was, yeah. it was really cool. <laughs> it's not what I want to do every day, I don't think, going mm -hmm. to work. But it was, uh, this has been quite an experience. But it gives you the feeling that what you're doing is exactly what you're doing in your BSL-2 labs. Uh, yes, actually, like, that's very interesting. As, as was pointed mm -hmm. out, what you're sitting in a hood and working with a pipette mm -hmm. is just like, you know, yeah. working in a regular lab. Right. Okay. Except as someone said, nothing happens quickly in a BSL-4. Very, very slowly. Everything yeah. has to be slow. And, and you mentioned at one point that there's this sense of solitude because you have to yes you're there for a very specific purpose you have to focus you got the air noise going on all the time mm -hmm. and and uh, i could feel that it's a very focused very uh, uh solitary sort of activity it's very mm -hmm. interesting yeah. there's no distraction there's no chatting people don't come exactly. in the phone doesn't ring really focused on your work you don't yes. check your email you just work yeah, exactly. and you like that very much right? yes yes i really appreciate that that's yeah. the best part of the sl4 and I mean, it's also a very nice part of BSL-4 that you really feel safe. Mm -hmm. So when I was pregnant, so I have two boys and I work in the BSL-4 lab when I was pregnant, during both pregnancies. <laughs> the second one was kind of tight because I worked in the BSL-4 one day before I delivered the baby. Wow. <laughs> But the reason Did you have I, a special suit to accommodate? I think it was more spatial than those. That's the reason why I don't like the blue suits. So they kind of discriminate a lot of uh, pregnant I'm women. I'm BSL-4 suits. So, the reason why I did that, so I didn't work in the BSL-2, by the way, because we had a lot of nasty pathogens in BSL-2, like toxoplasma and XMV, which, I mean, are really very, very bad to unborn. Yeah. So this is but fascinating. Beautiful. You're pregnant and you're safer in the BSL-4. Yes, the exactly. Theory. That was my feeling because I, I, I mean, I knew the risk and so I did my own risk assessment. <laughs> because that's the reality. I mean, yes. I, I thought that was a really interesting story the first time I heard it and Elka said yeah. I did my own risk assessment. The reality is I love science. I like my job. But you know what? I don't want to die for it. <laughs> so I want to make sure whenever I'm sitting there that I'm safe yeah. and listening to Elka say things like that understanding in all of that didactic training about how the suit works and how to put it on and all seeing all of that facilities you know that the guys who are the facilities people the security people the safety people are doing what they need to do to keep us safe and secure as we do that work hmm. it, it's it's no intelligent person would put themselves at risk. No mother would sit in front of a... a, a what do you mind? So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope our listeners watch the video and they will see how, in fact, 
safe it is to work in here. And there are very strict procedures, there's training, the facilities are amazing, and this is something I really had not appreciated no. at all. No, no. So it's a, this is a great message to send everyone. So it's incredibly secure, but beyond that, I, so I thought of BSL-4 as a lab and you grow viruses and you titrate them. But here you can do magnetic resonance imaging. There's an MRI right here. There's a imaging facility which you run, which has a which will have a confocal microscope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is amazing. So you can do incredible imaging. Because one of the challenges for Elka is whenever she grows the viruses, if she goes through the normal fixation processes, right, it destroys what yeah. she's looking at. Sure. So therefore. Why would you want to give yourself the trouble of doing it in BSL-4? Well, because you actually want to see something which is real, yeah. as opposed to sort of a, an artifact, which is, mm -hmm. it's been through formalin for X number of days, and it's been all of yeah. this, it just destroys yeah. what you're yeah. looking at. So you may as well yeah. not do the experiment. Yeah. The reality is, in, in, you know, there, there are a lot of blanks in our, in our knowledge yeah. of pathogenesis, yeah. irrespective of the level that you have to study sure. the pathogenet. Sure. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to ensure when this facility was built was that we didn't limit the questions that could be asked on the pathogenesis side in either level three or level four. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that, that becomes absolutely critical if you really think about how you design new vaccines, new therapeutics, new diagnostics. You need to be able to do cutting edge research. Uh, rather than just descriptive research, which is what many level four labs in the past have been uh, yeah. limited to. Yeah, this is exactly what I, I wanted to emphasize because the 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 facilities here are are better than many labs that are at BSL two. You have much Vince more has here. Been drooling over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's way better than my lab. I can't do any of this stuff, and it's amazing. join us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say <laughs> 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 The only way you get new equipment is you have to get a recruitment package somewhere. That's, right. That's, <laughs> right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, but um, you're going to be able to do cutting edge science on the most dangerous viruses. So you're going to advance our general understanding of pathogenesis. It's just so cool. It's, it, that's really the key here, mm -hmm. that you can do stuff that many other people can't do, and you can do it under the proper containment and safety uh, and really push it forward. I mean, your flow cytometry mm -hmm. facility, it's amazing to have it in a BSL-4 facility. So I, th I think this is another thing that I really learned. This is just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So this, if, if you get any messages from this episode, it's really safe here. Um, safe for the, probably being out in the real world, <laughs> and the the research can be awesome. Now, of course, you have to you have to get people here to do this, mm -hmm. and you guys can do part of it, but you need to get yeah. you have to hire yeah. more people. I think Absolutely. that's the other advantage of something like this. You know, we're almost talking about communication, and communication is really important. And what you do here, what ASM do with the video, what that shows people who can't come on a tour, who don't live in Boston, who aren't able to walk around it, who don't have the opportunity to do this, that gets the message out there that the work sure. is worth doing, that the people who are looking to do the work are interested in the work, are careful and, 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 and are actually interested in grappling with these diseases, disease pathogenesis, and this is mm -hmm. a, such a great place to do pathogenesis. Well, th these agents are all neglected because you can't work on them very well, right? Well, the ones you mentioned, these negative strand envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> Only the unimportant ones are neglected. <laughs> <laughs> They're neglected, right? And that's why a facility like this can contribute so much. Yeah, absolutely. So we do not understand the pathogenesis mm -hmm. of these viruses. Sure. So we don't understand why people die when they are infected with Ebola virus. They do mm -hmm. not die when they are, mostly they do not die when they are infected with measles virus which is so closely related mm -hmm. to these viruses. So yeah. and I think it's just important to understand why these viruses are so dangerous. And that's why I like being here as a person who is working with essentially a domesticated virus. So I see Alka's yeah. viruses as completely not domesticated. <laughs> They're just jumping species <laughs> yeah. all the time. Yeah. And what happens when you know yeah. whenever you've got that cat that's not really well domesticated, yeah. sure. the place is chaos and the person whereas measles has evolved and evolved and evolved and become exquisitely a human pathogen. It's being domesticated. Dangerous. Nonetheless, yeah. it, there's the yeah. residual. Mm -hmm. So just you think 
2,000 years ago when ever measles maybe jumped species for the first time, maybe it was the yeah. Ebola. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. trying to think yeah. about yeah. What, what those viruses do yeah. and then uh, pathogenesis to, pathogenicity diminishes and diminishes and diminishes sure. over time. Um, I like that domesticating. Mm -hmm. idea. This is really good. I mean, that's what it is. Measles is really a domesticated good. human pathogen. <laughs> we, got it. we usually say well adapted, but I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll I'm not sure I talk about equilibrium and non equilibrium. Yeah. <laughs> uh, domesticated works. Domesticated works work. really well. <laughs> so I want to get the last thing I really want to touch on, uh, I do, you can, you can do as well, but What's going to be the balance? So you, I've heard you, it said here that antivirals and vaccine research are going to be important here because mm -hmm. this is a place where you can do that with dangerous viruses. But there's, I also hear basic research on pathogenesis. So what's going to be the balance? Is that going to be depending on the investigators? Do you have a mandate to have such a balance? Well, you know, our, our mandate is to work on uh, NIAID pathogens of, mm -hmm. of interest, category A, B, C. Okay. Um, our mission is to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. That's the mission of this institute for emerging infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. It's always hard to, to think about what's the right balance. I don't think you can have good translational research without having good basic research. And the one thing we want to make certain is that we have a mixed cadre of individuals that study just the basic science of, of a virus. If, if it's a virus that we're talking about, understanding what their genes do, uh, how those genes affect immune function, how they uh, increase or decrease uh, their pathogenesis, the spread. Uh, we want to make certain that we have people that are interested in how would you actually detect this particular virus in a patient. Uh, I mean, how can you tell the difference between 20 viruses that behave like flu uh, in the first few days? And we have people that are, that are actually studying that, trying to figure out ways that you can detect them long before you consider someone viremic. Um, and we have people that are expert in trying to go the next step to doing post-exposure uh, post therapeutics. I think you need that entire range. And on top of that, you need engineers who think take systems approaches. We need people that think mathematically about how you put it together. I mean, look, look how many years we've spent picking the immune system apart. We know lots of details, but then we suddenly realize we haven't got a clue how it all fits together again, and much less how it all fits together again when a pathogen's sitting inside you. Uh, and so we need people to that take totally different approaches to think about it. And so much of that's basic research, mm -hmm. uh, but with the idea that it's going to help us move these along into both the clinic and to the diagnostic phase. So Elka, can you give us one example of what you want to do here? If this is now working, it's a BSF, or what, what are you going to do? Actually, I would be really excited to collaborate with Paul here. <laughs> So I think it would be really very neat to get a better idea about the spread of fewer viruses in in yeah the yeah the host the host organism of these bats. Viruses. Um, actually, I love bats. I, I could never ever infect a bat. No. Really? <laughs> so spread from animal to animal or within? No, the within animal? the animal. Within so the it, animal. Yeah, yeah, within okay. the animal because that's something we really don't know. We don't know what's going on in say the training room for not after infection, things like that. So I think okay. that would be really very interesting to study. And that's a critical concept in pathogenesis because the roots of spread exactly. are going to influence right. the outcome Exactly. Of the so, and I, mm -hmm. since you established all these very, very cool tools to do that, it would be just... What animal would you use for that? So, What's the I would, I, actually, of course, I would collaborate with sure, somebody. Sure. So, so, most likely non primates. Non-human primates? Yeah, it's the best animal model for filoviruses. And you could compare different filoviruses to see what controls differences in spread? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean there is one fetal virus which is ex uh, especially very interesting. This is Reston virus mm -hmm. because Reston virus um, does not cause disease in humans most likely, although it causes disease in um, experimentally infected non-human primates. But I mean, it's it's at least it's different from the other viruses. Right. So it would be really interesting right. to compare these these for humans mm -hmm. low pathogenic viruses to the highly pathogenic Ebola virus a year, which kills ninety percent right. of the infected patients. How about you, Paul? What 
you, you, I know you have a BSL-2 lab, but you want to do some things in here. Well, tell me one thing you'd really like to do in the BSL-3. I know uh, Alka wants to collaborate with you, but something different. So <laughs> my lab at the minute is very interested in this domestication idea, actually. Why is one of these viruses so exquisitely adapted to humans mm -hmm. and um, can circulate in humans. It would be able to circulate in non-human primates as well if there were big enough numbers of them so they could yeah. be naturally infected, but they're just not big enough populations to allow measles, for example, to circulate. So you've got this exquisite human pathogen, and then you've got its closely related cousin, mm -hmm. canine distemper virus, which infects a large number of different species. So why is measles so tuned to one species and canine distemper virus much more attuned to, to a range of species? And then you've got the questions of then pathogenicity once you start looking at that. So those viruses are very uh, lymphotropic, so they infect cells of the immune system. But measles is a little bit neurotropic, so it'll infect the brain on certain uh, instances. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to be vaccinated because people imagine that measles is not that dangerous, but actually people do die of measles even now. Canine distemper virus, highly neurovirulent. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've got this situation where a very closely related virus, they use very similar receptors to enter the cell. So is it all about entry? Mm -hmm. Or what restricts that cross-species jumps? And then you can begin to think about um, what would happen? Again, this is this is where we, we unite again. Polio virus eradication, <laughs> measles virus eradication. The World Health Organization have decided that measles is possible to eradicate. Number of people to, uh, d debate whether or not that's it, it going to be possible. What do you think? I actually think with the will, with 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 hmm. with for, with the caveats that you said, there's so many areas of complexity. The vaccine that we have at the minute would pretty much do it, but it's getting the vaccine to the right places. Measles is really thermostable, a thermo labile. Mm. So it's very, very difficult. Any um, excursion, for example, from the, 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 the cold chain, you might end up being vaccinated with the vaccine. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you think about this, you've got measles, which we've vaccinated against and people have had yeah. for many, many um, centuries. One of the debates which will arise if measles is, is eradicated will be, should we stop vaccination? Sure. Now, I would rather have the measles vaccine mm -hmm. than neurovirulent canine distemper virus or any one of these other pathogens which have the propensity to jump species. Okay. So you can see then, as a person who's able to manipulate the genes of the virus, right. how we can begin to address those questions in such a facility. What are the barriers to cross-species infection? Um, and then you've got appropriate animal models. Mm -hmm. So the ferret is a great um, animal model, a natural animal model, canine distemper virus model. You can do the macroscopic imaging, mm -hmm. you can do the microscopic imaging, and then you can begin to really understand how that virus is spreading around and what are those barriers which stop these zoonotic infections. So that's getting right at the core of what emerges. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. And the only way to do that, if you, so you can think maybe measles plus canine distemper, that's two plus one, does that equal three? As we humanize that virus. Um, now we're not allowed to do these experiments in Boston, but as you move forward, there will be people maybe elsewhere will want to say, well, what's, what, what, what about Nipah virus? Again, very, very closely related. Mm -hmm. It's um, endotheliotropic, so it infects the, the endothelial cells and causes this really acute mm -hmm. central nervous system infection. Again, back to what you were saying about the MRI. Why is that right. nice to have? Because right. you can actually see the infection of that Nipah virus. Uh, so so those, those viruses, those non-domesticated, domesticated viruses, viruses which have the propensity to jump species, I think I, that really interests me and that, that's why I like what that place offers me, even though I'm a BSL2 person growing in, in Elta's direction. You, you learn yes. from other people. Sure, mm -hmm. of course. That sounds great. Anything else from you? No. Do some email? Yeah. All right. Big part of Twitter is email. Why don't you read that first one? Okay. Nacho writes, we've heard from Nacho before, have we not? Uh, no. Maybe not. This letter's been sitting here for a while. We waited That's for this. Right. That's right. 
Hey, Twiv team, I'm a first year bioinformatics student doing my PhD in a virology lab. I, I visited the needle, the BSL-4 uh, Boston University, BSL-4 lab that the Boston University built a few weeks ago and really enjoyed it. During the visit, the director of the center explained that the building has remained unused uh, for more than two years after it was built because local community groups sued Boston University for building what they claimed was a, quote, bioweapons lab, unquote. This is just another example of the importance of educating the public about the true purpose of science, pursuing knowledge. Anyway, save me a seat for the anniversary episode of Needle in September. I just, here's the seat. I discovered your podcast a few months ago, and you've been a constant motivation for me to explore the virology world. I especially enjoyed the Lhasa episode back in number nine, and the incredible story of my compatriot, Jordi Casals, since I'm currently working with Lhasa and other hemorrhagic fe uh, fever viruses. Best Nacho. So this episode actually leaked a little bit. Huh? He knew this was. Coming. I don't know how he did that. I he think nice to mention the thing. <laughs> I, I didn't say we were coming oh, here. Right. I said we we're going to Boston. Boston. So Lhasa is a category four. Yes. 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 But you guys don't work on Lhasa here. You might, right? That's could awesome. here. It would be actually, an there's, a, yeah. there's a laboratory that works yeah. in a collaborative way okay. with another BSL four right so now. So if somebody so. wants, he said he visited the uh, uh -huh. BSL four. If somebody wants to tour this mm -hmm. facility and they come to Boston, can they do that? Yeah, we have uh, our um, government relations and, and communications group help uh, set up uh, tours here, and okay. we try to bring as many. We've tried to bring as many people in the public into this building as we can. Because I think actually seeing the facility walking around is, yeah. is very educational. It's it, it, it it makes a big difference uh, seeing something on the inside from what you sure. can't really imagine from the outside. It's, well, many people can't visit, but they can watch our film, right. our movie, when it comes yeah. out. And right. that'll be pretty good, because we had a really good tour. That was amazing. Uh, the next one is from Robin, who writes, The Invincible Vincent and Crew. You're included in that. Good. Here's the weather in degrees <laughs> centigrade. So Robin had previously sent us this link, and I complained that it was in Fahrenheit. But in fact, he tells us there's a little switch at the upper right. To change it to centigrade. Okay. We didn't get that last time. Yeah. Hey, look, you can switch to UK Ireland. Very good. See what temperature it is in Belfast. Belfast. Get Connor to Twitter you. Yeah. And so right now in Fresno, <laughs> Fresno California, it is 35 degrees centigrade. Uh, Boston's oh, way too hot. Yeah, that's very hot. Yeah, that's that's exactly. very hot. Boston is 23 degrees centigrade. Mostly cloudy with some afternoon showers. So thanks for that, Robin. Uh, we also have another one from Kenneth Stedman. Remember Ken from episode 195? Right, the, uh, the um, hot spring, not hot springs, the, the nasty environments. Boiling, right. boiling Springs in California, Boiling mm -hmm. something lake. Now I can't remember the name. Anyway, it's pH 2 and 95 degrees Celsius, this well, lake in California. Uh, it's in Lassen, Lassen Park. He actually. isolated a virus, a virus from this lake. And uh, he writes, as a TWIV bump, I'm starting a collaboration with Adam Abate at UCSF based on our TWIV chat. Right. So Adam apparently heard the TWIV and he's collaborating. So that's called the TWIV bump. Okay. Something good happens to you after you're on TWIV. So right, what's going to happen to you is your facility is going to get open because... Oh. <laughs> It's not like it. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I would love to write that as a bump, and then you have to stop making fun of polio, okay? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to live with her making fun of mumps all of the time. So yeah. you can live with her I making fun of polio yeah, for yeah, two days. All right, just a couple more here. Uh, one is from David. Just a quick email to say that I recently found Twiv and enjoy it greatly. I will try to branch, branch out into Twim and Twip when I can as well as making my way through the back issues. I, I have no idea how you've got the time to do all of them. I've only recently gotten into the sciences and will be starting a physical therapy degree in September, doing a preparatory health science course in basic biology and chemistry, which I took over the past year. I found myself much more fascinated by the small scale physiology and microbiology side of things than the large scale anatomy, leading me to find TWIV. I'm contemplating pursuing some sort of research route after I graduate, e.g. into muscle or bone physiology, 
although it's still very early days, of course. I was wondering if you or any of the team had ever come across anyone who started out with a large-scale focus in biology and zoomed in towards something only distantly related, perhaps even someone from a physical therapy background. Coming into the sciences after having only really studied the humanities feels a bit like being presented with an enormous buffet after having gotten by on oatmeal all my life. <laughs> That's great. Many thanks to you and the team for putting out a great show every week. Best wishes, David in the UK. Fans in the UK. Okay. Oh. SGM, after the SGM trip, Could publicly. Be. Physical therapy to, bio, to microbiology, no, but why not? Do you remember the person you talked to at ASM, Sarah Sawyer? What did Sarah do? She worked in the oil industry. Yeah, she was I was trying to think, of, right. I was trying to think yeah. of an example of a big jump. She was I a think, chemical I, engineer. I, yeah. I, we did a TWIV, TWIV 161. Listen to that. It was Gabriel Victors, who was a concert pianist. Yeah. Okay, and then became an immunologist. It's fascinating. Wow. Great. You can do anything. Right. You can go into microbiology from any field. Remember the physicists who went into phage biology in the 40s and Absolutely. 50s, right? Yeah. There are so many examples of that. So don't be limited by these barriers that we put up. We put names on things, but that's just names yeah. we put on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, absolutely. Think those, I think those big jumps are terrific because yeah. they bring perspective. They really do. And actually, it's so often problems get solved by people who come in from the outside from a very, very different background. Another one? Sure. Uh, Aisha writes, Dear Twivnauts, I'm responding to your navigation of the reforming science uh, in I, and I papers on the show. I was a bit disappointed in how you covered them. At times the hour sounded like a list rather than a discussion. It's a lot better than not having talked about it at all. So for that, thanks. I remember we were going through the papers point by point. We did discuss We did discuss um, Are there training fellowships for women academics who might be coming back after family leave in North America? Welcome has these in UK. Maybe this is a way to address one of the leaky pipelines. Good idea. Remember that you had a great deal of influence with what you created in your podcast. Look at what happened on the flu papers. Twitter uh, had an effect, some would argue, a huge impact. Look at what you have already achieved with respect to changing some ordinary people's view of scientists. People are listening. People are looking up to you guys to help them uh, with other ways to reform, not to tell us what we already know. Changes will be hard to achieve and unlikely. I don't think it's helpful to say that many suggestions uh, from the reforming science papers won't work. Maybe instead, like Rich said, let's come up with some new innovative ideas for solutions rather than saying change is unlikely. Thanks, Aisha. So I think that was a compliment, all right? Uh, at any rate, she Part, liked the partly. reforming, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the reforming uh, R and R show. Coming back to science after being on leave, we don't. Right. I don't know of any structured program. I don't know of any. You guys know of any? Well, the I mean, I know think. the trust. But yeah, the, the trust. Does. The NIH used to have supplements to help mm -hmm. women who had been out on family leave come back in, and I don't know whether they're still active or not. Okay. Now, I've encountered something like mm -hmm. this recently. Uh, so this is not a program, but. Uh, a woman who uh, got her PhD from the University of Florida and I think did a very brief postdoc and now has spent eight years uh, raising two children mm -hmm. and is ready to re-enter the workforce. Um, what we recommended to her was, you know, basically get up to speed by getting a postdoc. Mm -hmm. She ought to be able to do that. And she's applying for postdocs. And I think that's a good way well, to get training and, and, and kind of get retooled, get back into yeah. the business. So. On her other point, we were a little negative about being able to reform science, right? Now, I because yeah, it's a huge problem. I think it's a huge problem, but I I think it can be done. It will just take time, um, and since we've been around a while, we sort of know how hard it is for things to change. So, but maybe we we can't be so negative. We have to be. Plus, positive. you know what? 
But Old guys get worn out. <laughs> and they get kind of negative, all right? Yeah. And it's the new people, the fresh faces that come in with all the absolute optimism. They haven't been beaten up yet, okay? <laughs> yeah. Old guys that. can still get into a BSL for so <laughs> 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 yeah, yes. Listen, I, I, I felt my age as I was scrambling into that thing. <laughs> By the way, Aisha's uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, our Twitter Facebook page, and she wrote there that she's actually coming to BU to work in a lab here. I don't know whose lab. So, oh, excellent! Yeah, she should. She, she, look us up. she was sad. Look us she up. was sad that she wasn't here in time for uh, for this event, but she'll be here. So, mm -hmm. check her out. Should we do one more? Uh, sure. Rich? Alicia writes. Uh, I've been faithfully listening to the Twifecta for quite some time now, and I enjoy them all thoroughly. Though I don't know that I'll ever be able to catch up on all the old episodes of Twip. At 200 now. Yep. Mm -hmm. I hope you won't mind another self-serving, advice-seeking question. Do we mind? No, I don't mind. Go for I it. always listen with great interest to your answers to students, as I am just finishing my undergraduate degree in microbiology. However, I've noticed that all of the questions directed to you are in regards to continuing on in academia. It's taken me a few semesters of laboratory placements, a well-timed discussion by our panel of experts, and a few months of reflection, but I've decided that I might not have the drive to continue on in academia. I would be just as happy to be a technician of some sort uh, as a postdoctorate fellow, which is not at all how my peers feel. I intend to work in one of my professor's labs in the spring to determine if I am cut out to be a grad student or not, but in the meantime, I have much to think about. I found that in Canada and abroad, all that is really promoted in universities seems to be research and development as nothing else is ever discussed. I'm beginning to feel like there is nothing else. While I consider all of those involved in the trifecta to be at the top rung of the academic ladder, I also believe that you've had much experience with a wide variety of microbiology-based occupations. In your opinion, what can I expect to find outside of academia? Thank you again for all of your effort on these podcasts. They fill my days. Yes. <laughs> so, Alan, what do you have to say? <laughs> Alan talked about this yesterday. <laughs> so, what did Alan say? Well, I was in uh, the PSL. Oh, with one of you. Us, one of us so, I mean, this is one of the challenges um, I think that BU are trying to address talking to our. Uh, cohort of postdocs and graduate students about the other opportunities that are outside, which is why Alan went yesterday and talked to them mm -hmm. a little bit about yeah. communicating yeah. science. I think it was uh, sure. communicating science, netcasts, <laughs> uh, tweets, and um, I can't remember what the other one was. Yeah, Paul, Paul actually taught me how to tweet. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't tweeted before. You know who taught Paul? Connor, right? Your student. Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. <laughs> That's okay. Yes. So, so we, have, we, have a, uh, uh, we have a similar sort mm -hmm. of career development program uh, at, uh, at UF where we try and expose students to a number of careers. But obviously, there's journalism. Mm -hmm. There's law. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of uh, uh, legal issues, as you well know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but but they're also on the other hand there's biotech law there's all the all of that in fact one of my previous uh, uh, trainees is is a law firm partner now there's doing numerous making opportunities far more money in the, than I in the commercial sector yeah. Yeah. yeah um so there's but I think one of the issues she raises is is a good one I mean you know when you come up through academia you're told this is what you're aiming for right. and. As if everything else should be dismissed and, and is second place. And somehow that has to change because there are lots of opportunities and important opportunities in science that just isn't being about being a PI. That's right. But as you said, you come up through an academic. Mm -hmm. That's what you see. All your people around you, the mm -hmm. professors are all academics. They've done this. You don't hear anything else. You don't hear about writing or law or mm -hmm. business, but they're all out there. I mean, she could be a tech and be really happy. I know people who are techs in industry, mm -hmm. they have careers, mm -hmm. yeah. they move up the ladder, they do really well. Um, so I think uh, we have to fix this. We right. have to yeah. do better at telling people. And actually as science careers. becomes much more com complex, having a well-trained cadre of support people right. who, who can move between techniques and things becomes even more critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's... Uh, do some picks. Sure. We heard Alan's. What about you, Rich? What do you have? I have what I think is a an episode appropriate pick, a book that I uh, uh, recently read. Actually, it was recommended to me 
by, and now I'm going to mess this up, uh, Matt Cottingham, I think was his name, at the Jenner Institute. I, uh, I'll look it up while you're talking. Um, who um, uh, recommended to me this book at the Pox meeting. It's called The Angel of Death, uh, uh, The Story of Smallpox by Gareth Williams. Mm -hmm. um, there are a whole bunch of books about smallpox out mm -hmm. there, and I must say, I haven't read any of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first, so I can't make comparisons. Right? However, this is really good. Um, he does a very good job uh, in, well, in general, he does a very good job of telling the whole history of smallpox from ancient history up to its eradication. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of bits that I really like. Uh, it's often talked about that uh, uh, Mary Montague, who was the wife of the British ambassador yeah. to Turkey, imported the practice of variolation mm -hmm. from the Middle East to uh, England, and that sort of yeah. established yeah. that as a practice. He has a wonderful elaboration on that, okay? Mm -hmm. He really biographs her very well, and it's very thorough, and it's a very wow. interesting story. And the other thing that there must be a quarter or a third of the book um, uh, dedicated to this was uh, the anti vaccine mm -hmm. um, issue mm -hmm. that arose the minute vaccination came up, boom. There was anti-vaccination, yeah, and the tension between <laughs> and the anti-vaccination mm -hmm. and pro-vaccination uh, forces, and the mistakes that were made on both sides, and the consequences of that. Very interesting. There's a fabulous punch cartoon that you could maybe upload onto the um, onto your website. Um, where the, in Punch they draw these cattle coming out of the people's yes. ears, yes. and I can't remember underneath what it says. Uh, what what this, the the we, little line is? Have you used, used it? It just looks so great. Yeah. yeah, it might be in the book. Yeah. So the proceeds of the book sales of the book will support the Edward Jenner Museum in Berkeley, UK. Yeah. Have you been there? I have been there. Have you been to the? I Edward have Jenner? not. All right, that's great. Thanks for that. Uh, my pick is as actually suggested by your friend last night, John. Uh, John Connor. John yeah. Connor. It is a little cartoon put together by Skip Virgin's lab at Washington University, uh -huh. and why it's about why herpes virus is good for you. Have you heard about this? Yes. Yes. You've seen the cartoon. John yeah, told he, me about it. He, in fact, played it at a meeting at some point. It's two animated characters, characters talking to each other, uh, and uh, one of them is saying why it's good to be infected by herpes virus, and the woman, the other one, is saying, what? Herpes is a pathogen. How can it be good for me? And it's really amusing, and it teaches you something as well. So thanks to John for that, uh, and that's my pick of the week. And I had this guy's name right. It's uh, Dr. Matt Cottingham at the Jenner Institute is the one who uh, mm -hmm. exposed okay. me to this book. Very nice. All right, we have a listener pick of the week. It's from Luis. Hi, Twivers. I'm writing to you this time because I have just read a short report in El Pai, the highest circulation daily newspaper in our country. In his country is Spain. Um, referring to the fact that five exotic mosquitoes are establishing a permanent home in southern Europe. This is not really new, since global warming seems to be driving tropical species to northern latitudes. What I found interesting and probably attractive for you in the audience of your podcast is a series of maps which are produced by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. They show a detailed distribution of different species of mosquitoes and also ticks by provinces within Europe and apparently are periodically mm -hmm. updated. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. It's particularly interesting, the one that shows the actual distribution of the tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, a vector for dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, chikungunya virus, and others. In fact, there have been recent outbreaks of West Nile virus infections in Greece and chikungunya virus in Italy, for example. Mm -hmm. If you check the map, you will see that specifically the tiger mosquito appears to be recently introduced and probably expanding in Italy, southern France, northeastern Spain, the Balkans, and the Russian Black Sea coast. Thank you very much again for your wonderful show. I'm not sure if this email will be read before episode 200, but in any case, let me congratulate you all for this achievement and wish a very long life to TWIV. P.S. I almost forgot. It is very hot in Madrid, few clouds, and temperature about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. Celsius. And which reminds me that you can work with some sorts of vectors here in the BSL-4. We didn't talk about that room. What was the name of it? 
Insectary. Yeah, insectary. 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 Yes. So what is the one BSO4 agent which, or they are more of it, what is the vector for the one BSO4 agent which needs vector? A tick. Very good. And what is the virus? Crimean Congo hemorrhagic. Wow, you're exactly. here. You're yeah, listening. Nice yeah. Listen, when Great. you talk, I listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to imagine it before. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was going to forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope so. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have a place where you can raise ticks here and then put virus in? Yeah, I think, you know, we need the appropriate Great. entomologists, you know, to come yeah. in and, and help us establish that. But the, but the reality is, is that a number of BS BSL-3 pathogens are spread by mosquitoes and ticks, and then a number of BSL-4 pathogens are spread by ticks. And I think kind of understanding that transmission, yeah. those transmission properties is going to be critical to understanding okay. pathogenesis. Well, Could there you go. Could ask you for another virus, BSL-4 virus, which is transmitted by ticks? Another one? Yes. Yeah, several. Yeah. You got African swine fever virus. Oh, no, no, no. Carbright, Carbright. Back of the class. I didn't know there was going to be a test. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> go back in the suit now. Just give you some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you clearly didn't learn what you needed to. You don't get out. You have to stay here. No, 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 no. Do you want me to look it up? You know, there are other tick warnings. Oh, look, there's a whole page at CDC. The viral hemorrhage. Tragic fevers. <laughs> all right, well, it's all here. Yeah, both we'll South up. America and Central Europe. Yeah. Just yeah. give it a link. That would be the answer. That would be the answer. All right, TWIV can be found at iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, and TWIV.tv, as well as microworld.org slash TWIV. If you like TWIV, do subscribe. Now, if you go over to iTunes, you can do that and leave a comment there. That helps us to stay prominent uh, on the front page and get more people to listen to this a show about viruses, which is what we want. We also have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. You can also listen uh, to the to the show on, a, on your phone, your iPhone or Android device with the Microbe World app. You can find that over at microbeworld.org. As always, we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. We thank everybody uh, that's been involved. Ron, thanks so much for joining us, not only today, but helping us through this whole process. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful to have you here. It's been a great opportunity for us to show you the facility. Best of luck with your facility. Thank you. We'll El take it all. <laughs> <laughs> Elke Muberger, thank you so much for awesome. joining us yeah. and helping well, us also in the past two days. Well, it's a pleasure. I hope you, you can do your work here. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> and finally, Paul Dupre, thank you not only for helping us these days, but for coming up with the idea back in Dublin to do a TWIV here. Over breakfast. Yeah, and it just so happened to be episode 200. So thanks, oh, thanks it so perfect. much. It was perfect. Pleasure. I'm glad you came. Now you can change your clothes after. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> we have to I've got two shirts the same as this. <laughs> <That's what happened. laughs> Big thanks to the American Society for Microbiology <laughs> for helping us to do this. Communications Director Barbara Hyde and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega. So they came here from ASM and they have been tirelessly walking around with cameras for the past two days. Thank you, Ray, so much. It's been a pleasure. Chris, I know you're exhausted. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. But the work doesn't stop here. This has to be edited. So thanks for that as well. Thanks to all our listeners for getting us to number 200. Without listeners, there wouldn't be 200 episodes. We're looking forward to your being the inspiration for the next hundred episodes and, and, and for our being your go-to source for information about virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello and you can find me at my website virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.
Okay, good one. There's something so weird after having listening to them, just listening to yeah. the last little bit. It's very strange, you know, whenever you're part of something that you've only heard. It's very it was strange. Yeah, it was was that good? It's yeah, like really it's good. like watching click and clack instead of listening it's to really the really you know, It's really strange. It's really strange to decide him listening yeah. to him say that and yeah. you sort of just <laughs> it's <laughs> funny it's really weird yeah. that's behind the scenes right yeah. <laughs> well that makes it so completely different than listening to it on your earphones what's that it's behind the mic <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good that was great really good job yeah, I think we covered a lot of good things good. and the, the video will be complimentary to it It'd be perfect mm-hmm. right all right